everybody. Hi, water women and water men. Thanks for joining us. Um, thank you for making the time to be here, to join us um, in this gathering. Um, I deeply hope that one day we'll be able to have this kind of gathering in person when the time is right in the very near future, hopefully on a beach somewhere where we can also get in the ocean together. But until then, we will be, or I'll be, I'm so grateful for this technology to be able to see your faces and hear your voices and to connect um, with all of you as amazing water women. Before I go too far, I want to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from the saltwater country of the Bundjalung Nation in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales. I'd like to acknowledge the Bundjalung people as the traditional custodians of these lands and waters and pay respect to elders past present and emerging. Um, we'd also like to extend that respect to all First Nations people, this pod, not podcast, <laughs> it's kind of a podcast, the Zoom ripples out toward. Um, so yeah, um, paying respect to all the First Nations people that we're inhabiting the lands of. Um, my name is Lauren Hill. I'm a surfer and a writer, and I recently wrote a book called She Surf, The Rise of female surfing. Um, and I wanted to gather here to dig into some of those stories more deeply. Uh, the book really is about some of the most powerful or some of the powerful women who are stretching the bounds of surfing culture right now um, in terms of art, design, performance, um, what else? Activism, of course. Um, and, and as well as some of the pioneers who have paved the way for us as water women. I've been surfing for about 20 years now and have spent the last 10 years traveling as a professional surfer and writer and that title shocks me um, all the time that I've gotten the crazy privilege to uh, yeah, make a living from surfing. It's ridiculous. Um, I've felt a calling during almost all of that time to create more opportunities for women's stories to be heard and embraced within the heart of surfing culture through film and writing and um, and gatherings kind of like this one. So I've been trying to do that over the last decade and the book really builds on the, you know, hundreds of articles that I've written um, and the hundreds of meetings that I've had over that time of water women um, just like us and different than us um, and how, you know, women in different parts of the world are changing what it means to be a surfer in fundamental ways. Um, so I wanted to make the book a celebration. I wanted to drop the comparative narrative that women surfing so often gets represented through in mainstream surf media. I just find it totally boring um, and really the least interesting angle um, considering our culture is so rich and, and diverse and full of so many incredible stories that aren't being told. Um, the best numbers that I've found indicate that women make up as much as 30% of surf culture now. That's so big. And when you think about a surfing magazine, we're definitely not seeing, um, I'm not even asking for equal representation, just fair representation. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we saw 30% representation of women in surfing magazines. That never happens. And then think about the cover of the surfing mag, of any surfing magazine. That's, you know, that's the most celebrated place your picture can land in surfing really and I would love to see fair representation in that space too so seeing three to four covers of women on the cover of magazines every year but that's not happening but that's a, that's part of what I'd like to change because I like many of you probably believe that representation is powerful and and important um I wanted to make it really clear before we start if anyone's seen the book the book is in no way comprehensive. There are so many women that, you know, that I had to leave, leave out because of time. I was limited of, in time and page space and other factors like image acquisition and then being home with my toddler on top of that. Um, it's just a starting point. The book is a starting point. Um, this is another starting point. Um, it's just a starting point from what I've witnessed, what, you know, what I've interpreted as what it means to be a female surfer right now, or, you know, what I've seen other women defining as what that means right now. Um, and one of the main aspects that I've witnessed is the way that women 
in my experience, more than men interpret their surfing lives as a call to action to deeply engage with their communities and with local ecologies um, and gather and try to make the world a better place. Um, and, and so each of the women that we're hearing from today are doing that um, in both small and very big ways. And I'm so grateful for them to be here and to share some of their stories. Um, one of my deepest wishes for this book is that it, that it inspires other women and hopefully men too, to um, feel empowered and feel, to feel validated in sharing their own stories, surfing and otherwise. Um, so that's why we're here today to dive in a little deeper with um, some of these wonderful women. I'm gonna hand the mic over to Rhea. Not yet, actually, I'm gonna tell you about what we're gonna, how the flow is gonna go. Um, I should stick to my notes. I wasn't doing that, sorry. Um, so we'll have introductions next from Rhea. We'll then throw it over to Leah Dawson, who's gonna um, gather us for a moment of conscious breath together. Then we'll have story sharing from each of our storytellers. Then we're gonna do about a 12 minute breakout um, session, which is gonna be really cool, a fun way to connect with other uh, women in different parts of the world, hopefully. Um, and then we'll have some questions and then we'll wrap up. Please feel free at any time to type in a message on the chat bar on the right side of the screen. Ask a question if you have it. I'll be going through and picking out a few questions to ask to, um, to our storytellers at the end. Feel free to communicate with one another. That's there for you to resource at any time. Um, we're going to do our best to keep to the schedule, but if things get exciting and the conversation gets lively, then we're not going to cut anyone off, obviously. So feel free to leave if you need to. Um, so let's get started. I would love to introduce my friend, Rhea Cortado. She's a writer and editor and amateur gardener who played a really critical role in the writing of this book. Um, she was is a fact-checking copy editor, um, and I'm, I was so grateful to be able to throw ideas around with Rhea. Um, she's such a source of um, knowledge and wisdom from surfing culture and beyond. Um, yeah, she's, she's just an incredible friend and an ally in stretching open our surfing culture. Um, and she's made really important contributions uh, in helping brands and challenging marketing at various entities over the years to become more inclusive of women of color in particular. Uh, so I'll throw it over to you, Rhea. Thank you for hosting and for moderating. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Hey, thank you, Lauren, for that incredible introduction and start off to this event and also for being um, a thread that connects us all here today. Um, I'm super honored to introduce many of these women who I've admired over the years for their unique interpretations of surfing and surfing culture. Um, with that, we'll start with our elder, Cher Pendarvis. Um, who has been discreetly shaping our culture since the 1960s through her art, surfboard shaping, writings, and in laying the foundations for professional women surfing. Uh, Cher was one of the first surfers to ride the confounding fish shape. So you have that to thank her for. Um, was one of the first women on staff at Surfing Magazine and has probably spent more time making boards than most women alive today. Um, Danny Burt was crowned the first ever women's adaptive surfing champion. Yay, Danny. Uh, she's a director of physical therapy, an advocate for fleshing out representations of female surfers and a master of the backside pig dog. Uh, <laughs> we have Leah Dawson. Um, Leah Dawson is a free surfer and co-founder of the Changing Tides Foundation. Um, her wave riding style is a beautiful expression of femininity and strength and the way that she leads with her hips and her heart. Um, she just trims with this power of the sea that's incredible to watch and to be around. Um, through her work at Changing Tides, Leah has partnered with women-led organizations that empower girls to deeper connections with the ocean and raises awareness about environmental issues. 
So we're going to start with Cher, um, who has probably the most stories out of all of us, books and books of stories. Um, and we would like for her to share some of those, a small fraction of those with us today. Um, and as we were preparing for this gathering, she mentioned that she thought this moment was such a great era for women surfing. Um, Cher, could you talk us through a little about where we progressed and evolved um, as a culture during your 56 years as a surfer? Uh, sure. Um, uh, thank you, Rhea. Um, I'm really happy to be here with everyone. It's so good to see you all. Aloha to you all. Uh, I was born in California and in 1955, uh, when I was five years old, my mother and I moved to Oahu because my father was deployed on a ship. And my mom and I loved playing in the waves on the South Shore. We loved, uh, we lived in the hills above Waikiki, um, Malka. Uh, anyway, uh, the aloha that the Hawaiian family shared with us really touched my heart from an early age. We lived there for about two and a half years. And I watched men, women, and family surfing and riding longer wood boards that were finless, little pipos that were finless, and they were riding ku standing, uh, kakuli, which is kneeling, and kapapa, which is prone surfing. And they change positions sometimes, you know, because the waves at Waikiki, you know, they might start off kind of steep, but then it'll kind of back off and through deeper water and then come in through the middle part of the wave, maybe stand up and so on. So they change positions. So I saw, I noticed this as a young girl and I learned the Hawaiian language terms for these different positions from my Hawaiian uncle, Bao Ching. Anyway, um, from that moment, I wanted to surf, but my family situation didn't allow me to have a board and surf at that time. Um, but that inclusivity, the fact that men and women in equal numbers and children were all surfing together and families um, was, a, was a beautiful thing to see. When we came back to the mainland, surfing was mostly a, a boys club, so very rarely saw any women surfing. Um, and I learned to surf on borrowed boards. I asked my mom when I was 13 years old if I could borrow a lifeguard's paddle board. It was a Tom Blake style hollow wood board. And she said, sure, you know, so I paddled out and I caught my first couple waves on that. And then later on, I, um, when I was 14, 15 that summer, I worked patching dings to earn my first board that was a used board. So there's lots more to that story, but um, you know, as we progressed through the um, 60s and 70s, it was still mostly men. You know, the, it was pretty, um, most were neutral. You know, there were a few that cheered us women on, and then there were a few that were negative. So, you know, we just pressed on and let our surfing do the talking. <laughs> And those were really exciting times with board design. Um, that's when the, our friend Steve Liss invented the fish down here in the late 60s. And then uh, I started making boards and, and I made my first board in 68 um, and enjoyed experimenting with making different types of boards because I like to feel how they rode differently on the waves. And then um, some interesting events happened in the early 70s. Title IX was passed. And Title IX, um, for all schools that were federally funded, guaranteed equal, equal uh, access to all activities for boys and girls. So that girls were able to take sports, some for the first time, instead of home ec and, and sewing, which is what I had in school, you know, when I had been in school. So um, it was really a nice thing to see and girls enjoyed sports if they were drawn to that and then felt, you know, made their bodies stronger. They were able to paddle out, you know, be more attracted to surfing, feel more comfortable in the ocean. 
And then there was another event that was really important, I think, to women surfing, and that was in the mid 80s with the renaissance of longboarding. Because when boards went short in the late 60s, very few people kept their longboards, very few people longboarded, and it, it, was, it was very kind of, um, what did it say, um, judgmental um, to ride short boards or, you know, we didn't judge, but some people did. Kind of like when the clear thruster, everybody was encouraging people to ride the clear thrusters because that's what the pros at the time were riding, things like that. But um, I just want to jump in. Can I jump in for a second? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, it's okay. I just wanted to jump in and say that that that's um, some of us experienced that narrative of yeah. um, unfolding in surf culture, but for many women and men, especially surfers of color, um, access to beaches, to boards uh, was still and is still uh, extremely inaccessible. And we're still part of this gathering is to talk about how we can work to um, make surfing more accessible. I just wanted to add that note just as, you know, right, there's so many right. different histories and experiences of the way surfing culture has unfolded. Um, and it's definitely been a story of um, privilege up to this point in many ways. Yeah. Well, in, in modern Western surfing anyway. Right. Um, well, I couldn't afford to go buy a new surfboard. I was working and I left home very early because of a dramatic situation at home with my stepfather. So I left home when I was very young and I, I worked. And so that's another reason, you know, having learned how to learn my excuse me, earn my first board patching dings. I was comfortable with the materials. So I would just find old long boards that were beyond repair and use that foam to make some of my first boards that I made. So, you know, I was privileged to be by the ocean, you know, when I moved out on my own. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. But yeah, I had to make the boards to be able to have a board because I was working to pay my rent and things like that and getting ready to start college and so on, which I earned my way through school. But I just wanted to kind of circle back around and say after the renaissance of longboarding, and also there were some mid-length boards, which is another one of my favorite length board besides the fish. <laughs> um, there were some of those kind of in there like eggs, like our dear friend Skip Fry was um, making eggs all through that time. And so we started seeing more women out surfing and, and developing their beautiful styles because the women were attracted to the dance, you know, and smooth moves. And so that was beautiful to see. And then there was a contest circuit. And so there was like the, um, the progressive style that was kind of like longboarding a shortboard. And then there was the classic style, you know, which I was more drawn to the classic style myself, having learned on longboards in the 60s. But uh, this is a, a really special time right now because we have more opportunities for sisterhood and to reach out to one another and share stoke with one another. And it reminds me of those early years when I was five to eight years old when we were on Oahu and seeing this going on so many years ago in the 50s among the Hawaiians. So it feels like we're in a time like that right now where a lot of times um, certain days you might see more ladies out in the water at certain breaks than men. And it, it's really nice to see the men respecting the women surfing and and it's nice to see young girls growing up knowing that they can surf, you know, no matter, um, you know, like you mentioned, different, um, different communities. I, I know that there are situations where um, there were nonprofits in San Diego where they bring kids, um, inner city kids to the ocean. And we've participated in some of those, you know, with helping the kids have the experience to surf. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, Cheryl, what I really love about that story and sharing about your introduction to surfing is that, you know, your initial introduction to surfing in the 50s and in Hawaii was really, was one of inclusivity and part yeah. of the culture. And you didn't really feel that exclusion and those barriers until you came to California. Mm -hmm. really. um, yeah. You know, the, and I feel like that type of foundation is 
you know, is really important for nurturing your, your path forward. You know, if you had, for example, tried to start in California with these different, you know, feelings of not belonging or um, difficulty, then maybe, you know, maybe that, that could have deterred, you know, a lot of other women from being in the water at that time. So I just, right. I think that introduction was, and those types of introductions to surfing, that type of, you know, welcoming atmosphere and um, kind of reverence for the ocean, like makes such mm -hmm. a difference in your experience with it. It gave me hope because there definitely were the people that said, um, girls shouldn't surf, they should stay on the beach. You come out to this reef, women don't belong out here. Well, we just put our heads down and let our surfing do the talking. Yeah. So, and then eventually stop cutting her off, she's ripping. So you hear that by one of the guys who's now a longtime friend of many decades. <laughs> um, we wanted to circle back and talk a little bit about your work as a shaper and um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the relationship between board design and women's anatomy and the way that women surf differently um, for men and how, you know, maybe enabled with the right uh, tools or the right wave craft, then, you know, their surfing can really take on a different beautiful form. Um, could you mm -hmm. speak to us a little bit? Uh, sure. Um, well, a lot of women have a different center of gravity than men. I know me personally, my hips are about the same width as my shoulders. Um, before surfing, my shoulders were much narrower. <laughs> Thankfully, they broadened from paddling and swimming. Mm -hmm. uh, but typically for, well, personally for myself, I would recommend like half an inch to an inch wider. I like to ride a little bit wider board say, for instance, and my husband does. And it helps with the center of gravity. And I also like to surf with power and flow. I, I like smooth transitions between turns. And if a woman is wanting to do that type of thing, then there's rocker adjustment. There's rail foil profiles that, that can be changed and customized for her. I like a little bit flatter rocker. I mean, there's all kinds of different bottoms and things like that that can, can be shaped into a board. But uh, I think if somebody's starting probably a mid-length or a long board and something that's, um, I'd say, not too heavy, maybe an average width, um, excuse me, um, an average weight. Um, I know some people like really heavy long boards, um, the logs classic style, but, uh, I think it would be more versatile for women uh, starting surfing and intermediate surfers to have um, like a, a board that's say under 15 pounds, not something that's 30 pounds like summer riding for the longer boards. So I've got boards for, that are um, EPS uh, and epoxy that are really quite light. And then I have some that are more of like a medium um, weight. Yeah. Is there any specifics that anyone because surfboard design is just such a huge uh, topic um leah i know that you i yeah. see pictures of you riding the single fins that you you found some boards from the 70s that you enjoyed experimenting with sure yeah yeah um the boards that i've i've I try and uncover old boards, um, and I I feel like they still carry a lot of magic in them. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, back then was such a exploratory time of right. surfcraft, and it seems like every year um, there was such different changes going on. And um, the boards that I have gotten to ride um, from back then have kind of influenced what I like to ride now, and what I have my boyfriend shape me now. Um, with uh, really um, sexy down rails and um, and not too wide mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I it really varies. Um, I'll hop on on a narrow thick board and it'll work great, and then I'll hop on a, a really thin wide board and it'll work great. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really um, there's such a a wide like infinite playing field with board shape and design that's right. one of the beautiful factors of 
of right. our sport is that um, it is infinite uh, in what we can change and and experiment with. Um, one of the, I think this, this conversation is so important because in the past I've seen the conversation around women in design um, be had, but only from a marketing perspective, like only in terms of aesthetics, like adding sparkles to right. resin swirls and exactly. things like that. <laughs> but what we're talking about here is something very different and that is making crafts, crafts that work better for women's bodies, which tend mm -hmm. to be different than men's bodies. And Leah, I've heard you talk about this a lot in terms of, um, and, and Rochelle Ballard talks about this too, the way um, our f physiologies lend more toward loading through the hips instead of the ankles and the knees. Is that right? Can, can yeah. you elaborate um, on that? I think, you know, you watch, you watch female dancers move and a lot of their, their move stems from the hips. And in that sense, um, you watch Steph Gilmore and you watch old footage of Ralph Sun um, and these women are moving from, um, it seems like the energy is stemming from their hips. Whereas a lot of modern shortboarding is staying low and engaging and a lot more off the tail surfing. But um, from what I've seen, when the elegance really starts to shine through, it's almost in narrowing your stance and scooting up on the board, depending on how big the board is, but really utilizing the whole length of the board to find different positions of oh, if I actually stand straight and lean back, I'm gonna actually go faster. Or, um, you know, the most shortboarding, you only have your feet in two spots. Maybe you're lightly adjusting your back foot on d different terms. But um, I think women, um, there's this natural tendency to want to maybe move around and shift a little bit more. Um, maybe it's my background as a longboarder that has led me to want to, even if I'm on a 5'8 shortboard, I still want to be on the nose. Um, so there is this- I um, we used to do that. <laughs> yeah, there is that, this wide range yeah. of, of um, ability that we can find from focusing on the way that we have our hips. Like I'll show you real quick. A lot of times um, we'll tend to like tilt our hips this way and try and turn this way. Whereas if we actually tuck our hips, then it really opens up the whole range of motion a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think as, as we all start to, to continue to explore um, uh, our technique and and um, also seeing photos of ourselves helps um, you know and 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 um, as a ballet dancer stands in front of a mirror the whole time our mirror is photographs or video and that's not always that easy or attainable to get for for everyone even as a professional surfer it's very hard for me to like get video and photos of um, what I look like, but sometimes it's like passing around the camera with the friends and saying, okay, this is a, a learning day. We're, we're gonna take photo or video of each other and, and try and study and pick apart the, the parts of our surfing that I'm constantly like, gosh, I wanna do something different with my arm or like, I wish I like moved my legs a little bit different here that turn would have been so much better if I would shifted this foot a little bit here and opened up my shoulders. Um, and all of that plays into board design as well. Yeah, it does. I agree with you, Leah, about tucking in the butt and getting more power out of your legs. I totally agree with that. It's also really about core connection, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's about, yes. it's yeah. about yeah. Uh, strength and, and developing power. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Danny, did you want to jump in here or um, have any thoughts about how, you know, board design or how that your surfboard uh, shape or the shapes that you choose um, really affects your style or um, your needs for writing? Yeah, sure. And uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, but I ride, so anything from a 6.0 to a 9.2, uh, 
the shorter I go, uh, it gets difficult for me because when my prosthetic foot hangs off the back, uh, when I go to pop up, it tends to snag right there. Uh, my go-to board uh, is a Pintail Mini by Bing with a quad setup. So with the quad setup, um, I need speed. Like the more speed I have, the more control I have, I feel. Uh, especially since I'm missing like my knee and my ankle. So yeah, that 7.4 is definitely my baby for sure. Mm -hmm. How long is that one, Danny, may I ask? 7.4. Oh, 7.4, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like, so I have a 6.6, six, 7.4, and a 7.10 of the Pintail Mini. I'm sort of obsessed with it. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Great design. Oh, well, when I, I'm sure everyone here knows, like, this, when you find a magic board, like that magic board might not be magic for the person next to you, but sometimes things click and um, it's such a like, I don't know, for me, it's so infinite on why things click and why things work the way that they do. But if you get a magic board, don't let go of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And for me, it's like the, with my surfing since, I'm missing the majority of my back right leg. It's most of the power and everything is coming from my hips and my core and my upper body in general. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think overall, like men, women surfing, whatever, uh, yeah, your hips are the most important thing um, to get that power from. Mm. Yeah. So we're gonna switch over to Leah now um leah you've been so incredibly privileged to travel around the world um, and meet different women from other cultures and i wanted to ask you what what are some common values and perspectives that you see in different surf cultures around the world specifically women surfers um, and then also like how do you see these women bring you know their own culture into surfing in like a really, you know, different and special way. Sure. Um, I have seen women and girls feeling so alive um, with the relationship that they have with the ocean. No matter what country I've been in, um, it seems like there's there's not as much stoke in the in the men out in the water or at least visibly like this emanating joy but um you see a woman out in the lineup and and like you can see this vibration um emanating from her um just from um the pure and simple joy of being in the, in the ocean. And um, this spirituality that um, I feel like is inherent in um, being a woman and um, being in the sea is something that um, is really profound and that I've spent um, a lot of time um, kind of meditating on and, and trying to figure out why is it that we have this um, really, really deep, um, almost primal connection um, to the ocean. And, and um, I think it comes down to this feeling of uh, it being, whether or not consciously desired, but it being some sort of medicine and some sort of joy and passion that that ignites fire for for life um and no matter the skill set involved um women are that i've seen are out there enjoying it just to get their hair wet and um to feel the ocean around their ears and um to have the nose drip at the end of the day and um and that's really been beautiful for me to watch, especially in the last 10 years, I've seen the women's surf culture blossom so beautifully um, in spirit, but also in numbers. Um, as Lauren mentioned earlier, that 30% that, um, uh, was not the case um, when Lauren and I were growing up in Florida. Um, 
And, um, you know, I was extremely blessed to, to meet Lauren, I think when we were 13 or 14 and, um, uh, you know, we were two of, of the girls in a, a sea of, of many, um, young boys. And, and, um, I always ad admired her elegance and her femininity. Even like, I always say it like, Lauren, from the time you were 14, you, you had like the most impeccable style and most like, uh, beautiful approach on, on waves. And, um, I think, you know, back then that was the first time that like I was really witnessing style and feminine style. Um, you know, my idea of women surfing was Gidget. Um, and, and, you know, uh, there was definitely the influence of, of the blue crush days with, with Rochelle and Megan Abubo and, uh, Serena Brooke and, and, those amazing surfers. Um, and I, I, uh, I see now there's such a, an extreme, it's almost like catapulting women, uh, and young girls are getting so good, so quick and equalizing this, this playing field. Um, yes, in both technical skill, like that video of Sierra Kerr from the wave park, um you know doing massive airs um you know equal to the boys her age um i didn't know that that was that that would become a reality as quickly as it has um but with with longboarding there as as you have shown share like there's always been this elegance from the mm -hmm. time women started surfing it's nothing right. new um but now it's more in mass and there's more of us mm -hmm and we're mm -hmm. reclaiming our story and we're telling our story ourselves instead of um surf marketing so it gives me goosebumps yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's like <laughs> it's it's, re it's rejoicing because now yeah. we're now and it's it's we're still working through it i think we, mm -hmm. we did and lauren's spoken a lot about this like right uh, we've had to overcome the sexualization of surfing um, and now it's like everywhere I've gone, there's, there's women surfing and there's a, a plethora of them. And, um, from, from all ages to all, you know, types of women, it's just, it's really been, um, heartwarming to see uh -huh. that it's, it's now a balanced culture and, or it's becoming oh. more balanced. And in the lineups, men are much more encouraging and um, accepting and uh, like willing to let you go if you're in the spot. Um, respectful. Respectful, right. Yeah. And, and it's, it's taken time and it's taken continually coming out and putting on a smile and trying mm -hmm. to raise the vibration because we all know sometimes surf lineups can be like, real low vibration exactly um, and and i think that that's part of our our duty is to help raise the vibration of what surfing is and this mm -hmm. territorialism maybe can be left at the door and this celebration of the moment um can really be um put on rise yeah i just wanted to jump in for a second and be a little bit of a contrarian um Leah, thank you. So <laughs> you're so kind. Um, I want to be careful about the language we use about, um, and this is a real surf marketing angle of like, women are so good now. Women have right. improved. Women now are such better surfers. And I think what has actually changed is we just have different kinds of surfing to aspire to. It comes back to that adage, you can't be it until you see it. And so now, like when, when we were growing up, Leah, hardly any women hung 10. It's, right. not, it's not that women couldn't hang 10. It's that we weren't seeing any imagery that gave us the idea that planted the seed of, oh yeah, maybe I can do that too. And I think that's, that's actually what we're seeing is we're just seeing with, with more and more um, versions of what it looks like to be a female surfer, sure. we have more and other, you know, different pathways to aspire to. Because I, when I think about 
the incredible surfers of the past, someone like um, Princess Kayulani. She mm -hmm. was riding an Olo, which is like the most challenging board anyone right. could ride. If you can paddle an Olo and catch a wave, you're, you are just beyond in terms of strength, skill, and power. Um, so there's nothing, I don't think, inherently better about female or male surfers now. We're just, we're just changing what wave riding looks like. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exploring it. Yeah. Given the opportunities. Yes. Right. The opportunities, exactly. Given exactly. the opportunities, yep. Rhea, do you want to... Huh? What was that? Do you want to ask Le Leah another question? Um, well, adding on to, I think, you know, cracking open this different perspective on women surfing and women surf storytelling, I think, you know, again, Lauren, in your book, you mentioned how women translate their surfing experience as, you know, a call to action in social or environmental engagement. I think that's, you know, a really huge common thread, I guess, with, with women. Women are very community focused. Um, I mean, obviously surfing is important to us, but I feel like when we bring, when we show up to surf and we're bringing our stories, then I think we bring so much more than just the act of surfing. Um, so Leah, for those who are looking to be more engaged with, you know, in social issues or environmental issues, what do you suggest for people? Um, number one thing is, um, tell all your friends to vote and vo like make voting, um, like the most exciting day that, yeah. that we look forward to. Um, because, um, I've started to, to dabble in a little bit of, um, of, policy. Uh, I got to go to Washington DC this year with um, Surf Rider Foundation and um, got to see um, firsthand um, how, how to talk with lawmakers and um, sometimes they'll listen, sometimes they have a blind, blind eye and, and closed ears, um, but that our elected officials really, really, really make a big difference in our environment and in social issues. Um, so it's our duty to research um, our candidates and, um, and hopefully we have great candidates running for, it's not just the top seats in the house or the head of, of the country, it's every city council member, it's every mayor, every governor makes such a big difference, especially right now. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would say let's all like be big. At, I know in, in the States, um, we have a, probably the most important election of, um, of our lifetime so far um, coming up in November. Um, so um, definitely have our, our sights set on that and and be uh, encouraging to our peers to to get out and be active in that way. Um, but we we have to look locally what what we can do in our own communities. Um, and um, that starts with every choice that we make from our food that we eat to um, to the community activities that we participate in and to the dreams that we can create of, of potential um, uh, programs or organizations that um, can collectively bring together this desire to do good. I think, especially amongst female surfers, there's such a, an inherent desire to to want to participate in the goodness of sharing happiness and joy and equality yes. and, um, and it's connecting with our community members and, and being creative, um, taking leaps and, um, you know, it, it definitely helps to, you know, my, my dad has always said like, who'd you talk to in the airport? You never know who you're going to meet, you know, and, and a lot of times we're, we're uh, 
we're taught to not talk to strangers and people in passing, but um, in order for change to be made, it's not going to be solely. It's not going to be on an individual basis. It's going to be together. And in that togetherness, we have to communicate with each other and we have to talk to each other and we have to put on smiles when we're in passing with, with people to like put out that positive energy. And as much as we are in this social and environmental plight to right the wrongs that were um, going in such, like, such a, a painful way for both the people and the planet. Um, we have to, uh, for, for, from my point of view, we have to put out love and we have to put out as much light as we possibly can. Agreed. Uh, and it's, it's contagious. Um, you know, you smile at someone, they smile back to you, darn, it feels good. Um, so in little, little things like this, um, are definitely momentous because they, they, um, we want to live in communities that, that work together. Um, and, uh, find your local CSA, um, farm that you can get farm, farm food from. If you have a green thumb, grow it your own. Um, I'm, I, it's definitely a dream of mine to, um, to start growing my own food. I know Lauren is, is living the dream right now, which is so cool. Um, but talk, talk with our peers um, and don't be afraid to go for it. And if you have a big idea, write it down and talk about it with people and um, know that the, the universe is supporting you in your dreams, especially if it's in line with um, the communion of the universe. So um, put it out there and, and let's do some great things together. And that's part of what we want the breakout, the breakout um, time that we're going to have in just a little bit to be right. just a moment to connect, to exchange ideas, to, um, to yeah, dream together. Um, I feel like that's an easy seg over to Danny, who's doing um, incredible work in so many ways, helping people in so many ways. Ray, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, Danny, we'd love to talk to you about being the first female surfing adaptive champion. Um, and also what's so interesting about your story is you said that I feel like, is it true that you didn't start surfing until after your accident? I mean, you definitely had some experience in the water, experience on the board. Um, what, what called you to the ocean? Well, uh, so I'm born and raised Jersey Shore. Uh, and at a young age, my father, would take me to the beach and overall we didn't really talk at all like we would do our separate things like he would go swimming I would go bodyboarding for a couple hours uh, and doing that I felt at peace and this joy and happiness uh, being in the water and it, it was something that I didn't feel anywhere else um, uh, so with my family life, like as it worsened, uh, I had to go to the ocean as much as possible. So I would take like public transportation. Uh, I would get on the bus if I could, because I was so young and alone. So sometimes they wouldn't let me on the bus. So I'd walk or skate and it was just, the ocean became my home and it became like the place that I truly, uh, felt what love was uh and then there was a time there like for a couple years where I got into drugs where I didn't go to the ocean uh and uh, as I got closer to graduation with high school I had stopped drugs but I knew I couldn't be in Jersey anymore so I decided to come out to San Diego and I had never been on a plane or anything before um so that was pretty cool. And then I knew one person out here. So I was like, oh, if I get in trouble, I have one friend to fall back on. Uh, and I'm still uh, amazing friends with her today. And she's my family. But so I come out here to San Diego and I have my motorcycle crash probably like a year and a half later. Uh, 
And after rehab, I got back into skateboarding. Uh, I picked up snowboarding, started competing in that. But the one thing I was really missing was the ocean. And so I tried bodyboarding, but that wasn't very fun since I really hurt my left ankle. So putting on a fin, uh, it wasn't, it just wasn't a good time. And my friends at the time who were, who are surfers, they're like, why don't you start surfing? And I said, yeah, sure. But I had to go in without a leg and I loved it. So I took all my old parts to my leg, took it to my friend and I was like, let's figure this out. Let's make something that can go into the water. Uh, because at this time, what, like 12 years ago or something, there was no such thing as a leg that you could take into the water. Um, so through a, a bunch of trial and error, we devised something and it worked. I was able to walk into the water, carry my stuff, uh, stand up surfing, and uh, I was home again. I, mm. I just found like, you know, I was just in this state where my mind was nothing but uh, calm and peaceful. And to mm. be in the ocean again, it just brought that all back. And I contribute being in the ocean again to where I am today and all the successes that I have had. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, I love how you talked about the ocean being, you know, such a refuge for you and what it's given you and, you know, how it's helped you through, you know, different times in your life. I feel like everybody can really relate to that, you know, regardless of what it is that you're going through that, you know, when you go into the water, you feel, you know, I guess, heal or hold in some way. Um, mm -hmm. I know you've also talked mm -hmm. about, you know, representation and diversity in women's surfing meaning a lot to you. Um, what, what does representation and diversity in surfing mean to you? And why do you think that that matters? Well, acknowledging that representation is such like a broad topic and there's so many levels to it and we have short amount of time, so I'll try to do my best. Uh, but you know, with, with saying that, I'll start with visibility. So uh, I posted recently about um, how I used to go to the library when I was a kid and I would flip through magazines like Surfer, Thrasher, uh, Body Border, and you know, I was always looking for someone who remotely looked like me and there was never anything. The only pictures of women were laying on the beach in thongs. Uh, and, you know, being a child, you're soaking all of that in. And what you're soaking in is that uh, you don't belong. It's, you're not even worthy to be seen. So when I think about it, honestly, like visibility is like surface level. It's like face value kind of stuff. It's like, this should be, um, common sense, it should be common practice, it should be easy, because it's like, you know, the, wor the world is diverse, um, but we seem to have this huge problem with it. And I mean, from, from there comes representation. And I feel that uh, we would all benefit if we take a step back and we look at our social media feed, we look who we interview, who we bring to the table who our employees are, who the, the people are in leadership roles, making the decisions. Because if it's homogenous, um, it's a problem. And then, you know, to be more specific, if it's all white hetero ma male, it's a problem. And even if it's, you know, all white female, it's a problem because it's like no change really happens if, um, well, no, no real change, will happen because you can't see through someone else's lens. So, you know, this, uh, it makes me think of what uh, Viola Davis said before, and I wrote it down so I don't mess it up because I love her. Uh, she said, art has got to reflect life or else it's not art, it's commerce. It's filtered, watered down, and I want to see truth. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's just, to me, what she's saying, it like just, it goes above and beyond uh, art. It goes into everything. Um, and it's like, what, what I want, what I want to feel, what I want to see is like, 
people making decisions that know knows what it feels like to be gay or a person of color or a woman of color or someone with a disability uh because when it comes down to it it's just like you know if we don't uh it's just watered down and eventually the progress that we've made will evaporate and once this movement or moment is done and the hashtag is over like it just it disappears and we've seen that you know throughout history um yeah that's my stance <laughs> thank you danny i just i love you so much and i'm so grateful that our uh our surfing culture has you get has you to to contribute all that you do and i i'm an environmental scientist by training and in ecology the basic principle is uh, diversity is health diversity is life to be against to be against diversity is to be anti-life and mm -hmm. to be against the, the, the growth um, and flourishing of our species and so um, it's silly I mean it's it's, yeah. it's just anti-life and and I think we're at a moment in time right now where we're so many of us are learning how we can be better gardeners of our culture and how we can plug in and encourage diversity more fully in you know in, in deeper engagement how we can lift up other women and other men and and for our surfing culture how we can um encourage the inclusion of the many diverse histories and experiences that we see just within women's surfing culture. Um, so thank you for being part of that really important movement. Yeah, no problem. And it's just like visibility is just so important because you're also sending the message to the people that are in the room and in leadership. This is what we want to see and this is what we want more of. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, the work it's big and it's small and it can be as like simple as like just looking at the people like your crowd the people who you hang out with or like yeah us as like influencers like just what we decide to put out there into the universe mm. Mm. yeah that's a that's a um a really nice transition um what Danny's speaking about, I feel like, has to do with culture. And we, the beautiful thing about culture is that it is so adaptive and uh, it's um, rooted in creativity and rooted in decisions we make every day. And that is markedly different from a big, not a bigger problem, a smaller problem, which is the surf industry, the industry of surfing and how it has been, how it's become a very, very narrow, and I might say often boring representation of um, a homogenous picture of what surfing is. And so, Rhea, that's a transition um, to you since you have worked within the surf industry for um, many years as a writer and a storyteller. Um, how have you seen surf storytelling change over your years um, in the I mean, industry? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to Leah's, what Leah mentioned before, like when you guys started surfing, um, you know, what the typical woman surfer looked like, I think from that period of time to now has changed a lot. I know when I started surfing, maybe like 10-ish years ago, um, I would say I was looking for stories about women who um, were not contest surfers and who were not being sexualized like period. I felt like in mainstream surfing, that was like the real dominant narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. also found that the way that women were being covered, even where it was very like white cis male gaze and white male worldview. Even when, even when other women were being covered, it was still, com it was still the questions and the content that they were being asked and how they were being framed was in this very like specific type of worldview um, that I, you know, personally just didn't really relate to. Um, again, this is talking about like the mainstream male dominated publications. I think once you got into like some of the more niche publications, then it's, you know, what Danny mentioned, we're talking about white, beautiful, cis, able-bodied, pretty women. 
um, which is fine too, but um, that's still not diversity even within like the female spectrum. And then from like a marketing perspective, then it was, you know, all of those publications and all of that media is controlled by, you know, the advertisers and the brand that are selling stuff to women, which is not representative of the entire culture. Um, so I feel like the way that surf storytelling has changed over time has just become much more decentralized. Like, so before there'd be all these gatekeepers and this media channeling information from these people who, you know, inherited their jobs because they knew the right person or they, you know, whatever it was, they had some sort of social capital um, to get in those positions and they would funnel stories about their friends or advertisers. And now that, you know, we don't have to go through those channels anymore, then I feel like it's really exciting that surf storytelling can change. I mean, you don't need permission to publish your story on the internet, to publish a YouTube video, to, you know, put out your own magazine. You can start, you can do a Kickstarter for it. You can do a Patreon for it. You can launch, you know, your own podcast. I feel like um, there's so many more opportunities for people to get their stories out there and for them to be seen with the exception of the algorithm, which also, by the way, um, not to get in the weeds, but I have heard things about the algorithm also being um, not totally uh, balanced, I guess, in the way that it funnels information to you on all of those channels. Um, so, so yeah, I think also the conversations that we're having now are much more emotionally intelligent. They're much more nuanced. I think even what we were talking about maybe five years ago is really different than what we're talking about now. I think we're really like starting to break open that like white worldview and recognizing that that is a dominant framework that's like, that's like the air and the water around us that we're starting to unlearn about. And that's coming, you know, and that's going through the surfing lens too. Trying to be um, mindful of time. Thank you, Rhea. I'm really grateful for all, all the contributions that you give to um, our culture and for your words just now. Um, I'd love to take it back to Leah for a second. We got a little bit ahead of ourselves and didn't have our connective breath moment. So I'd love to let Leah create a moment of um, just a bit of. Uh, embodied breath connection together and then um Rhea will do a little bit of an intro to the breakout groups and then we can spend around 12 minutes breaking out and then um, hopefully have a minute to reflect and share a little bit together then we'll come back and wrap things up so Leah I'll hand it over to you um some some may have made the connection that um the ocean breathes on the shore um, and it's very similar to our incoming and outgoing breath and um, I've learned in Hawaii that this shoreline of where the ocean uh, waves in their life onto the beach is a very cleansing and renewing energy um, and so that too is the breath um, and so if we um, gently take breaths into the lowest part of our lungs, filling the back of our stomachs, more so than focusing on filling up our chest, um, focus on filling up the belly and the back. And using this breath as a way to connect ourselves to, to the primordial essence of the ocean. Um, we can be brought right to the water's edge um, in our mind and feel the rejuvenation um, that the ocean brings um, just by taking this conscious breath um, deeply into our amazing bodies. Um, we are extensions of the ocean and with our breath we're able to access um, that amazing energy and, and rejuvenating mindset. So let's, um, let's take a few deep belly breaths together. And um, if you're um, 
feeling like visualizing the ocean um, breaking up onto the sand with your breath and rolling back out. Um, let's have a few of these breaths together. Breathing is, you know, often something we do unconsciously um, to live. Um, yet when we remind ourselves to consciously breathe, uh, the power that it can create is profound. Um, and our world needs us as powerful as we could possibly be. So it seems like a pertinent time to focus on our breath. Thank you, Leah, for that wonderful grounding moment right now. Um, so, you know, the reason why Lauren wanted to put this together was to, you know, connect the spirit of, um, a, of women around the world um, and how we were connected by surfing and our shared values for the environment. Um, and social issues. So with that, we're gonna put everybody into small groups. So uh, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a little, these have all been randomly selected and you're gonna get a little pop-up window, I believe, on your screen um, asking you to join a private room. Um, and with audio and video, we encourage you to use both. And if for whatever reason you want to leave the private room um, or you want to opt out, then you can put leave and it will just put you in the main holding room um, until we all reconvene. Um, but we'll be in there for about 12 minutes and we think it'd be fun for everybody to, you know, meet a stranger and hear each other's stories and really engage with somebody that you maybe wouldn't have um, run into before to, you know, talk about these issues that we all really care about. <laughs> Olga's got her boobs out. Put some clothes on. Oh, it's hey, Daniela. We're oh, eating tacos. Oh, why did you guys wear this shirt? Lucky. I'm sorry. It's a bathing suit. I'm coming over. I'm coming over. <laughs> we just we just came from the beach. We just came from the beach. I need some tacos. <laughs> Uh, sorry, but I'm getting crazy. I think this is the view we should we should always have, Lauren. It's like just the flipping through everybody. That is like so much more interesting than like looking at my own face. Like I I wish we did that like the whole time. <laughs> Mine was on that. Mine. I was looking at everyone. You weren't. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at all. I was looking at everyone with the, like our listening faces and our oh, oh, no. faces. It was so <laughs> nice. <laughs> Right. Our chewing faces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. yeah. That was insane for me. I got the most, I just got my mind blown in that breakout box. I hope that that <laughs> was an experience that other people had too. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think Sharon and I missed our question, but we had a good chat. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, I know. I missed our question. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, do we want to answer? I had a few questions um, on that a couple people asked that I wanted to throw out. Um, yeah, everyone wants to go back to self meeting, that'd probably be helpful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Stella. Longmire asked, I've been learning to surf over the last six months or so and I've moved from a foamy to a seven foot mid-length thruster. Oh, that's an interesting combination of elements on a surfboard. Um, I want to keep working on this board, but I'd like to work my way down to a smaller size twin fish. How should I go about doing this? I think I feel like Cher is the perfect person to ask. How do you work your way down to smaller boards? And Leah too, actually, Leah, well, actually everyone. I know Danny rides smaller boards too. 
Um, anybody yeah. want to jump in about your tips for transitioning smaller? Cross train. Yeah. yeah, definitely training, you know, cross training. Um, when I was competing uh, for the early women's pro events, I, I did, uh, I surfed two four hour sessions a day. Um, uh, but I also took ballet at night. Uh, and now as an older surfer uh, approaching, uh, dare I say, uh, 70 <laughs> next month, uh, I'm doing uh, yoga every morning. Uh, and I, I really don't want to miss a morning and I'm doing push ups and I'm doing crunches and I'm doing my rollout ball exercises and just a lot of things that it just really helps um, with the fitness. And our Y pool is closed right now. Uh, and the beach has been really crowded and people aren't practicing enough physical distancing. So I haven't been swimming at the beach and haven't been able to go to the Y pool, but I usually do lap swimming or I do my laps um, at the beach, you know, or um, the uh, access at Sunset Cliffs has been a little, a little difficult in some areas, but you know, I like doing the lap swim down there too. So definitely. Um, and the fish doesn't have to be really short. I mean, a fish can be really fun at 6'6 six, six if the shape is right. So if she's riding a mid length, you know, she could go to a longer fish, you know, like even 6'8. I have a 6'8 that um, Skip, um, Uncle Skip Fry shaped for me in 2007. That's a super, super fun board. So, you know, she could go down a bit you know, to a size like that. And then if she wants to master that and then work to a shorter one, then by all means. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they're about, let's see, the skipper I think is about 21 and a half inches wide. And um, I have a little 5'7 right over here behind me and a 5'6. Um, they're about, tw one's 20 and a half and one's 21 wide. And they both have low rails. The five seven has a little bit more lifted rail in the nose and a tiny little bit of belly. Yeah. I, I love Anybody what a surfboard um, nerd aficionado you are, Cher. It's so <laughs> refreshing because I'm still pretty I just I just ride whatever is around. Like I'm not that I, I don't really focus that much on design. So it always really stokes me out when I hear other women talking in the proper language and like me, I'm just ignorant. I didn't know how technical you wanted us to get earlier, you know, because I could have talked about a lot of different types of bottoms and things like that. But I think that um, something that's simpler is, is best kind of to start with. And then as, as someone's ability increases, then, you know, trying different types of bottoms, concaves, triplane hulls different rail configurations, but something with kind of a more neutral rail through the middle and a little bit more of a lift toward the nose. It's more forgiving so people can have more fun, you know, until they get where they, they get comfortable and they mm -hmm. want to try something um, like, uh, like some of our 70 era, 70s era boards, like what Leah was talking about with the sexy down rails. You know, we have, we've, you know, that is really a unique feel, you know, but if, if people aren't careful, it's easy to catch a rail. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when they're, when they're surfed right, you know, when you get used to it, they're some of the faster boards. They're really, really fun. And that's a lot of what I rode um, when I was surfing Hawaii in the 70s um, and mm -hmm. the North Shore. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. Anriel wrote in, uh, on this topic of surf marketing and brands backing females, I see much less in the way of YouTube videos of girls actually ripping. Many of the ones I've found are not showing girls surfing like boys do. Um, those that I do, do see are rarely taken by female surf photographers, videographers, and don't get the same funding for the trips that I see many of the big brands sending boys to. Oh yeah, I, um, I remember that. I remember being at working with one of the um, endemic surf brands and being on the women's team and then my partner being on the men's team and being privy to what they were spending on the men's marketing trips compared to the women's marketing trips. And one trip in particular, they spent about a quarter of a million dollars on the men's marketing trip. And I think we had like, you know, 25 grand or something to 
make the same thing happen. Um, and that's, that, you know, that's years ago now, but now, yeah, there's not outside of Instagram, there aren't really surf films, women's surf films happening as much now. And part of the, part of what I wanted to come out of this conversation um, was just ideas from you all. How do we, how do we unify? How do we work together? How do we um, create a force as a culture that runs parallel to the industry? So eventually they can't ignore us any longer. Um, so totally open to ideas. Let's keep in touch on that note. Feel free to write in on the chat bar. Um, anybody else want to chime in? Anybody else have a question or want to chime in? Um, hi. <laughs> I don't know. Hi. 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 Um, I just wanted to chime in on the surf part. I actually contacted you on Instagram here a couple days ago. So I'm working on a surf film right now for that very reason. And it's having to do with how women are using surfing to heal from traumas and abuse and you know different things like that so I don't know we all have a, a platform here in some way or another and um, I'm grateful for the ability to be here and hear all these inspiring stories from you guys because like wow wow like Danny especially like my mind is just blown right now it's incredible how strong women are and the strengths that we mm -hmm can gain from from the ocean you know mother ocean and it's just powerful stuff so just thank yeah you. thank you guys for this this is incredible yeah thanks for, thanks for joining sarah thanks and thanks for um your efforts in putting a film together i'm excited to correspond about that further yeah definitely awesome muting back yes surfing definitely helped me heal a lot um when I was young and also develop a sense of independence because the situation at home was really um, uh, violent and I just had to keep put my head down and deal with things, uh, try to be a good kid, a good student and surfing gave me hope. I mean it was from the early days when I saw surfing in on Oahu and then when I came back to the mainland and then my stepfather came into our lives then um surfing was a place that you know once i was able to get started with my own board i have been borrowing boards it definitely gave me a safe place to go you know even though i didn't have a lot of friends and i was teaching myself how to surf and working and trying to figure out how i was going to start going to college and things like that so i'm i'm just extremely grateful for the gift of surfing every drop of water every wave every friend yeah <laughs> sure i feel like that's a great place to wrap things up um thank you share for those sweet closing words um thank you all for being here thank you so much for your time and your energy and for being part of this global sisterhood um i hope we can stay in touch and um do this again hopefully like i said earlier in person next time uh, please don't hesitate to reach out or um, to try to connect with your breakout person if that was something you spoke about. Um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for the beautiful work you're doing, each of you in the world in your own ways. And um, yeah, take care. Thanks for connecting. And this, um, this video will live on the SIA's website at some point. And I definitely want to say thank you to SIA for making uh, this gathering possible, for um, giving us the, um, the very skillful Madison to help us with all the tech. And thanks to <laughs> Leah for your time and Cher, thank you. And Danny, thank you so much. And Rhea, thank you for helping me to conceptualize this gathering. Um, do you wanna, do you wanna um, talk us out, Rhea? Um, I think, I feel like surfing has such a huge opportunity right now to, to change, to do something different. We're having like such a huge awakening, I feel like in our culture and 
Um, and yeah, I just hope that we can all like run with that momentum and continue to put pressure, continue to um, to move forward and to you know create what we want to see in surf culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May I share something, Lauren? Sure, please. Oh, okay. Um, a wave is moving energy and it travels sometimes thousands of miles before it gets to where we can ride it. So we think about that special energy and uh, just the feeling here in our hearts of respecting that energy. I mean, it could have come from a short fetch like a wind swell. It could have come all the way from Antarctica, all the way across the Pacific to reach our shores here on the mainland or vice versa down to Australia and New Zealand and so forth. And so my dear friend Ralph um, used to say, um, a wave is energy made visible. And we ride that energy, we respect that energy and we connect that energy all the way till it spills on the sand with gratitude. Think about where that wave comes from the next time you paddle for a wave and are gifted to catch it. Because um, surfing really is a gift and every wave is precious. We're just so blessed and fortunate to be women surfers. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all. Take care and let's be in touch and share some water time soon. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.